So thank you, welcome for being here. As mentioned, I am one of the shelter medicine interns for Maddie Shelter Medicine program here at Cornell. And today I'm gonna talk about sanitation and disinfection in the animal shelter. I know that is probably the most interesting topic that's going on today. Um, so thanks for coming to this one. I think it's really important because it's kind of one of our big main day-to-day -day tasks that occur within the shelter. And when we start to think about outbreaks and disease control, this is one of the places you wanna to look to see, you know, is this where our breakdowns are occurring? Is this is where we're starting to lose staff compliance in cleaning and sanitation protocols? And as the license, or as the LBT is kind of in the practice, I think your roles are one, to kind of help create protocols, especially in shelters where you don't have veterinarians. But honestly, you guys are probably the first people that the staff goes to when the staff have questions about what products are being used, why certain protocols are in place. So my goal today is to kind of talk about different strategies for cleaning, talk about a couple different disinfectants, so you guys can take that information and either adopt it to your practices or, <clears throat> excuse me, um, or answer the questions that your staff may have, because often it is the kennel techs, the animal care technicians that are the ones doing the majority of your day-to-day -day cleaning. So when we think about you know, what is our goal of cleaning and what is our goal of sanitation? We look at our shelter and we have these large movements of animals coming in and out. And with that movement comes a lot of opportunity for disease, specifically our infectious diseases, those caused by our pathogens, the bacteria, viruses, the fungi. Um, I've got some common one listed here, but the point of this slide, you know, I could sit here and talk for hours and days about just listing different infectious organisms in veterinary medicine. But I think you want to look at what's gonna be common in your shelter. Are you a shelter that sees parvovirus commonly? Are you a shelter that sees a lot of ringworm? Do you see skin parasites? Um, <clears throat> that's gonna kind of be, when we go through this presentation, we want to, when you take it back to your practices, gear toward what is gonna be common at your shelter. And then when I do talk about some of the various disinfectants, we're gonna talk about some of our viruses that are a lot harder to control. These are gonna be our non-enveloped viruses like canine and feline parvovirus, as well as feline Khaleesi virus. And then we're gonna think of kind of ringworm as a separate, you know, the, the dermatophyte ringworm because that's a lot harder to control. <clears throat> So I'm gonna go over a couple definitions before I kind of progress, just because I'm gonna be using a, different, a few different terms throughout the presentation and I wanna make sure everyone's on the same page. So the first one is, you know, what is sanitation? Sanitation really is just our promotion, promotion of hygiene. That's washing your hands after you go to the bathroom, that's sending your coworker home when they have the flu so that the next week when you have to give a conference presentation, you don't also have the flu, <clears throat> which that clearly didn't happen. But that's kind of just our promotion of health. Then we're gonna look at our detergents. Our detergents are gonna be our soap products and the goal of the detergents is to physically remove some of our organic material. And I'll give you some examples of organic material in the next slide. <clears throat> but organic, uh, we want, the way detergents are made is that the chemical structures is like half of it kind of picks up our dirt, picks up our oils, and the other half allows it to be rinsed away with water. So the detergents physically remove the bacteria, the pathogens from the area that's gonna be compared to our disinfectants. Our disinfectants are now gonna start actively destroying and um, stopping the bacteria, the viruses from growing. So we're now gonna physically destroy the, the pathogens compared to just removing them from the site. Disinfectants work on a majority of bacteria, viruses. One of the things that they generally don't cover are bacterial spores. A lot of those can become chemical resistant or heat resistant. So disinfectants are gonna remove the majority of your pathogens, but they're not gonna remove all kinds of microbial life. That's gonna be where you have sterilization. And I'm sure you're familiar with sterilization is often limited to certain things like your surgical instruments. So it kind of has a separate <clears throat> function, and I'm not really gonna to talk too much about sterilization in this lecture. So when we think about sanitation and cleaning, it is a three-step process, and it has been mentioned in a couple different lectures throughout the weekend. So our first step is gonna be mechanical removal of organic debris. That's gonna be followed by cleaning with a detergent, and then finally cleaning with a disinfectant. And it's necessary that we have all three steps of these in order for our cleaning process to be effective and really make sure that we're reducing the pathogen load in the environment. So that first step is mechanical removal of organic debris. That means removing any visible matter, um, food, feces, urine, <clears throat> any you know, vomit that's occurring in the cage, anything you can visibly, visibly see, removing that. 
And one of the reasons this step is really important is because a lot of our pathogens, especially our inter intestinal parasites and our intestinal um, protozoa, a lot of those are dose dependent in the environment. Meaning if you have a really heavy contamination, you are directly more likely, or the animal's directly more likely to pick up that pathogen from the environment. So in these dose dependent diseases, we really wanna make sure that we can physically remove as much of these of this environmental dose as possible, so then um, we can start applying our detergents and our disinfectants. And then one of the things to think about is some of our disinfectants can be inactivated by this organic material, so you can spray uh, bleach all you want on a pile of poop, but at the end of the day, it's still a pile of poop that has to be physically removed from the area. So when we look at our mechanical removal of debris in kind of this example, so number one, you wanna remove this big girl right here, this organic material. You wanna get her out. Um, then you wanna rinse away this urine that's kind of here on the ground. Um, I'm positive there's poop smeared on the walls from this little puppy that's gonna be need to removed first before you can start doing your disinfectants. And then just picking up these toys, the food bowls that are out here, and then the bedding as well. So once you removed all this, the next step in the process is going to be cleaning with our detergents. And like I said, these are often our soap products. Our detergents are going to remove our invisible organic matter. So that's often the residue that's left behind. Um, like if you pick up, if you're poop scooping, there's a little bit of residue that's left behind. If you're washing off urine off of a, um, the floor, any residue that's left there. It's the oils from the skin and the fur as the animals lay on the ground. It's dirt that's being tracked in on their paws, on your shoes. So you wanna make sure that's gonna be removed. Like I mentioned, having this organic material still present can make some of the disinfectants not work properly. So if you look at this area, you've got a bank of kennels that are running kind of through here. So number one, we're gonna go through and remove the animals, remove any visible organic material then kind of go through with a scrub brush and our detergent, picking up the stuff that we can't physically you know, pick up and remove. And then we're gonna to wanna to rinse afterwards for a couple reasons. One, um, it's, I think it's a lot of safety if you're walking in chemicals that are kind of being there can make the floor slippery. But also some of our disinfectants can also affect, or some of our detergents can also affect our disinfectants. So if we have soap there, um, our disinfectants may not get to the surfaces properly. It may inactivate them so they're not working. So we're gonna do our mechanical removal, our cleaning with our detergent, and then now we're gonna move on to disinfecting. And this is kind of a big subject because there are a lot of different disinfectants and I'm sure a couple have been talked about in other lectures this weekend. But this is where we're gonna start actively removing and destroying our pathogens that are on our surfaces, that are on um, you know, whatever it is we're trying to clean. And choosing the perfect disinfectant can be difficult. Um, I really don't think there is a perfect or an ideal disinfectant. The way I like to think about it is each disinfectant has its own purpose within the shelter. Some may be used for your, you know, everyday dog kennels. Some may be used for your hospital, your isolation area. Um, so when each of these, they have their advantages and disadvantages, and you want to kind of think about what is the purpose of this disinfectant in my shelter, if there even is a purpose, and then is it gonna be, same as, is it gonna be the same as a shelter that's five miles away, 10, 100, 200 miles away? So when we think about which disinfectants we wanna choose, there are a couple of big things to consider. The first is our spectrum of coverage. I mean, our goal of disinfecting is to remove these pathogens um, that are you know, wherever they are. So we wanna think, am I using the right disinfectant to kill the bug I wanna kill? If I have a room of parvovirus, am I using a disinfectant that's gonna kill parvovirus effectively? So we wanna think about what bacteria does it cover, what viruses, if you have any ringworm, is it gonna cover a ringworm as well? Then you wanna think about safety, both to your animals who have to be living wherever you've just cleaned, and then to your workers as well. Some of these can be irritating and corrosive if you're handling them, if you're breathing them in, and then for the animals, if they're not rinsed properly, they can cause some chemical burns and be really irritating to the skin if they're not thoroughly rinsed. We do wanna think about contact time, and contact time is the amount of time the disinfectant has to be left on the surface before it's rinsed away in order for it to be effectively um, destroying the pathogens there. Some of them vary between a minute to 10 minutes. So you wanna think about, do I have the time to, to have this 10 minute contact time, or do I need to look at a disinfectant that has a smaller one? And then lastly, everything in this world comes down to cost. 
So you want to think about, do I have the resources to afford this disinfectant in this volume, or do I need to switch to something that's a little bit cheaper? <clears throat> so I'll go through multiple groups, but I want to talk about the ASPCA Pro on their website has this really good disinfectant quick reference. At the top, it lists a whole bunch. Um, you may not be able to read it from here, but I've got some links at the end of my presentation. <clears throat> at the top, it lists a couple different groups, and then it says, you know, is it effective against parvovirus? Is it effective against Khaleesi? What's the contact time? Are there any other things I need to consider? So I think it's a really good reference to have when you're choosing your disinfectants or to have it in an area in case any kennel staff have any questions. Um, you might want to laminate it, put it up on a wall somewhere, make it readily accessible. So I think this is a really good summary of a lot of the stuff I'm going to cover in kind of the first half of this presentation. So the first group are quaternary ammonia compounds. These are often Kennelsol, Parvosol. There are literally hundreds of these, and I could sit here and list them all day. These are the two that I kind of um, came across readily, <clears throat> but I'm sure you, know, you may be using different ones. A lot of our general household cleaners kind of fall into this quaternary ammonia compound. So what are, <clears throat> so what are the advantages? Generally, they have a good spectrum of coverage. They're gonna hit a lot of bacteria. Um, they're gonna hit some enveloped viruses, but they're going to be a little tricky when we start looking at our non-enveloped viruses. So Kennelsol on its label is going to say it's effective against parvovirus at a different concentration. Parvosol is really questionable whether it hits parvovirus. A lot of them, when you're thinking about parvovirus, you're not going to want to use your quaternary ammonia compounds just because they are so different and so variable. You're going to want to use something that's more reliably effective. And then it's not going to be reliable against Khaleesi virus. So you may not want to think about it in your cat housing because it's not really going to hit that really important virus that can spread really easily. And then it's not going to be effective against ringworm as well. So if you have any areas that you're concerned about ringworm, you might want to think about a different disinfectant. But I think you know, they do have their, their place. Um, if you're looking at a general dog housing population and you're healthy adult dogs, if you're not thinking about parvovirus, I think it's a good choice. <clears throat> Some of the other advantages is they can be used in step, twos and step two and three of the process, meaning some of the disinfectants have um, some detergent qualities. So you can use them as a detergent and a disinfectant and it kind of gives you a one step so you're not having to scrub and disinfect separately. In areas where you're really concerned, you might want to separate these two out. So you're using, you can use the same product as a detergent in step two and then use it again in step three as your disinfectant with the proper contact time. And generally, for the quaternary ammonia compounds, their contact time is 10 minutes. So you're going to need to think about, am I in an area where I have my dog runs that I can let this sit for 10 minutes before it's rinsed off? And it does have to be rinsed off. For the most part, when mixed properly, they're non-irritating. But you want to think about a lot of the products we buy, we buy them in concentrated forms and we dilute them. So of course, you want to be careful when you're mixing them. Um, I would recommend wearing gloves. But when mixed properly, they're not irritating. A lot of people generally like them because they do have the detergent properties. They have a deodorizer often, so they usually smell nice. And they're relatively inexpensive. I know it's got two money signs, but I'm going to compare everything to bleach, and I probably should have put bleach first. But if we think of bleach as our cheapest, our quaternary ammonia compounds are going to be maybe a little bit more expensive, maybe one and a half times as expensive as bleach is. And that's going to really vary depending on the product that you use. So like I mentioned, bleach, um, also known as sodium hypochlorite. Bleach is really commonly used in a lot of places. I'm sure you also probably use it in your house when you're cleaning as well. Bleach has a really good spectrum of coverage for bacteria, for viruses, both um, enveloped and non-enveloped viruses, and as well as your fungi like ringworm. The important thing to remember about bleach is bleach varies by dilution. So when you're looking at hitting certain pathogens, you're going to have to change the dilution that you're using. Your general day-to-day -day cleaning is a 1 to 32 dilution of bleach. That's about, if you use your household bleach that's sold at 5.25%, um, that's about a half a cup of bleach to a gallon of water. And then when you look at ringworm, that's a 1 to 10 dilution. Um, I know it's kind of throwing a lot of numbers around, so the ASPCA Pro also has this really great bleach dilution calculator that lists as, at the top um, you know, what pathogens are you trying to get. Is, are you trying to get parvovirus? Are you trying to get ringworm? and then tells you the concentration that you need. Um, I also have the link to this at the end of my presentation as well. But it allows you to put in the concentration of your bleach. Like I mentioned, most is sold at 5.25%, but when you start looking at buying commercial grade products, it might be a little bit different. I think some are sold at like six something. So you can put in your concentration. 
Um, and then you can put in your dilution and it tells you exactly if you're making a gallon, how much bleach you need. If you're making a quart, how much bleach you need as well. So it's a nice quick reference to have on a computer that's readily available so you can just start make, um, putting in your numbers. The thing to remember about bleach when you do dilute it is it's only stable for about 24 hours. So it does need to be remade up every day. So that's something to consider. Um, and then you can use it in the morning, use it at the end of the day if you do a second round of cleaning. But during that time, you want to keep it in a, in like a dark area, or like a cabinet would probably be best, just so it's kind of protected from light because it can be inactivated from light as well. Bleach is readily inactivated by organic matter. So like I mentioned earlier, if you're spraying bleach on poop, it's really not going to do much. Um, so it's really important that bleach have a detergent that's used first. You're going with it through a soap. Um, to kind of clean everything because your bleach really isn't going to be effective if you're not cleaning up all that organic matter first. It does have a 10 minute contact time that's both for the 1 to 10 and the 1 to 32 dilution. Um, so it's pretty similar to your quaternary ammonia compounds in the contact time. One thing to consider is it can be irritating and corrosive. I'm sure we've all had that experience with bleach where somebody didn't mix it properly and as you're cleaning your eyes start watering, your throat starts to burn a little bit. Um, I worked with the kennel staff. I mean, the guy was trying to do the best he can. He thought if he used straight bleach, it would be better. Um, fortunately, there were no animals in the area, but when I came in, he was literally crying. <laughs> um, so it's really important that it's mixed properly. It also, so you know, if it's irritating to you, it's going to be irritating to the animals, so it needs to be rinsed afterwards. And then it can be corrosive to your metal, so that's another really important if you're using it on your metal cages to make sure that it's rinsed and cleaned thoroughly so that it's not damaging the metal. Um, a really important thing to remember is that bleach should not be mixed with other chemical compounds. Um, a lot of times it can form dangerous gases, I want to say ammonia gases, that can be really irritating and really dangerous. So it's important that if you're using anything before bleach to thoroughly rinse and clean that off before you use your bleach separate. And then I would not recommend mixing anything in the same container to kind of save steps. And then bleach is going to be our cheapest. Um, I didn't kind of look at actual prices because there are so many variabilities in prices for different chemicals. But if we think of bleach as our cheapest, um, because you can dilute it and use it so much, that's kind of going to be what I compare everything else to. <coughs> One of our newest groups are the potassium perioxy monosulfates. These are commonly trifectant or vertcon. I have trifectant pictured here in the, um, in the image right here. These have a really good spectrum of coverage compared to bleach. The only thing that they don't reliably get is ringworm. And there are a couple new studies that talk about whether trifectant um, is effective against ringworm. And if you have any questions, oh, there is another ringworm talk later. I don't know if they're going to answer it. But um, generally, if you're looking at ringworm, I wouldn't go toward trifectant. If it's all you have, you may want to look at some of the studies to see if it's effective and what concentration you need to use it at. But you might want to think of using bleach um, or a different product to reliably get ringworm. It does have some detergent activity, meaning you can use it in steps two and three, like I mentioned, um, with some of the quaternary ammonia compounds. For some of the really heavily soiled, you might want to think about doing it in two steps, so using it first as a detergent and then um, using it again as a disinfectant and letting it sit for the 10 minute contact time that it does have. For the most part, when mixed properly, they're not irritating to you. I know a lot of people are really, uh, they don't like the smell of trifectant. That's the one I'm most familiar with. I'm not familiar with the other, um, the Vercon. But the important thing to remember is trifectant is often sold in tubs of powder. And that powder can be really corrosive and really irritating. Um, so at a minimum, you should be wearing gloves when you're kind of scooping it into your bottles or whatever you're mixing it in. Um, if you can, wear a mask or have something to protect your eyes, especially if that powder is flying as you're opening the bag to kind of get your scoop in there. The really good thing about them is they do have a seven-day shelf life, meaning um, when you make it up one day, it's good for about seven days. And I know Trifectin at least has this color additive so that this hot yellow in the background is what a properly mixed um, Trifectin should look like. And then as it goes throughout the seven days, it starts to lose its color and turns into this pale yellow. And this is when your boss yells at you from across the room come, telling you to come change it. And that's when I got yelled at, <laughs> um, that I had to come change this trifectant. <laughs> oh, and so generally, when looking compared to bleach, they're going to be about two to three times more expensive. 
So that's going to be something you want to consider when choosing your trifectant. It does have a good spectrum of coverage. Um, you may want to use it in smaller areas like your exam tables. It doesn't have to be rinsed afterwards like bleach or some of the other ones do. So it's nice for your exam tables or your intake tables. Um, but a lot of times if you let that water sit there to dry, you get this like white streaks that go across. So you may at least want to think about wiping it down. One of the newest products are the accelerated hydrogen peroxides. Most commonly um, is Excel. Rescue is another one. Rescue, I think, is the new veterinary directed Excel products where Excel is going to be our human health marketplace and Rescue is going to be our veterinary marketplace. And then Oxivir is another common one as well. <clears throat> These have a really good spectrum of coverage. They're going to hit your bacteria, your viruses, as well as your fungi. So they're going to be effective against ringworm as well. Um, and they do have good detergent activity. So like some of the others, you can use in step two, step two and three. The important thing to note, at least with Excel and Oxivir, is it's sold in two different types. So if you get the Excel TB or the Oxivir TB, that's going to be your one step cleaner and disinfectant. Um, but they also sell it just as, just as a disinfectant. So you're going to look at your labels to see whether it's that one step cleaner and disinfectant or not. Um, when I was looking into the rescue products, I wasn't as familiar with them because they've just kind of been released, I think, throughout this year. Most of them seem like they are a one-step cleaner and disinfectant, so you can use it as your steps two and three, but that's going to be something you want to look at the label. It's just a product I'm not as familiar with. One of the biggest advantages is they do have a five-minute contact time. So in areas where you can't dedicate that 10 minutes to letting the um, disinfectant sit and saturate these surfaces, you might want to look at Excel. Um, so some studies have shown that Excel is, a, is effective at even at one minute, um, but general recommendations are about five minutes to use. They're non-corrosive. It's going to be a lot safer to you, to the animals, um, to the surfaces that you're using it on. It's not going to be as corrosive to metal. It's even nicer for the environment if you're really concerned about that because of the way the hydrogen peroxide breaks down. Um, I think it smells really nice. I like that better than trifectin and bleach, mainly for the smell. But it's going to be your most expensive. So when compared to bleach, it can be anywhere from like eight to ten times as expensive. So you may, um, depending on your resources, you may use it as your general everyday cleaner in your dog and cat populations. Or you might limit it to your hospital or even your isolation areas. <clears throat> So now that we've chosen our disinfectant, um, what do we want to think about as we're going through our shelter and as we're cleaning everything? So we want to think about the material that we're going to clean, the animal safety and stress levels, fomite spread, and as well as zoonotic diseases and staff safety. So let's think, let's talk about our surfaces. You know, are we cleaning a metal kennel? Are we cleaning a concrete floor where the dogs are that may have cracks? Um, if it's not treated, it can be more porous where pathogens and water can sit in these cracks and really not dry effectively. If you've got areas like that, um, if, you, if you're able to, you might want to limit the animals that are there just because you're going to have some, um, some areas that are going to be harder to clean in those, clocks, in those cracks and in those porous areas. Or I know in a lot of outdoor cat patios, you may have a wooden deck. Those are a lot harder to disinfect because of the surface. And then carpeted areas. Carpet is really hard to get a thorough cleaning. So you want to think about what surfaces are your animals going to be in contact with. And then, of course, we always have the question of how do you keep dirt clean? So when you have your outdoor lots and your play areas, um, you know, how do we go about managing the diseases that are going to be in there? The best recommendation really is to limit access. So you want to have your adult, healthy, mainly, I'm assuming mainly dogs. I don't think you have cats in your outdoor areas. But it's mainly going to be your adult, healthy dogs, older than six months, fully vaccinated, no outward signs of infectious disease, but of course sometimes we do have our aclinical or our asymptomatic shedders. So that's when some of the other steps come into play. So we want to think about how often are we scooping these play yards where these dogs are playing. Um, ideally, if you have the staff or a volunteer who's out with the animals to pick up poop as soon as possible, but at minimum it should be once a day. And that's because when we think about some of our intestinal parasites like our coccidia. We may have animals that aren't clinical but are shedding some coccidia. That, when it's passed through the feces, is not infective, but in about 12 hours will sporulate and become infective. So that's when animals that are out there can pick up these new pathogens and get the disease. <clears throat> so that's why at a minimum it should be at least once a day to kind of um, poop scoop the areas. And you know, make sure you don't have any areas where water is kind of pooling, um, where you've got these huge mud pits. Um, 
I know you do want to provide shade, but a lot of times a good sunlight can help clean up some of the pathogens as well. And then for our cats, we want to think about our dishes and our litter boxes. Ideally, when we look at cleaning them um, together, you want to have a separation of time and space, or at least one of the other. So it means if you have separate sinks to clean your dishes in your litter box, that's the best. Um, if not, you want to do your dishes first, followed by your litter boxes. So you're not mixing that contaminated fecal water with any of the dishes that the animals are going to be using. And with these, you can use a disinfectant as well, commonly bleach, you know, to use your dish soap first and then follow with a disinfectant. Um, much like I mentioned for dogs where you have these diseases that can be um, passed in the feces, non-infective, and then um, sporulate, you want to think about like toxoplasmosis, which can take a day or two to sporulate and become infective. So when you think about um, cats that have diarrhea, especially any kittens that have diarrhea, you might want to switch to moving a disposable litter box because that way those can be tossed at the end of the day or however often you're cleaning. Um, you don't have the risk of them going in with the dishes. And then with something like toxoplasma where it can be infective to people, you limit the amount of handling. So it kind of just goes straight to the trash and um, you know, people are handling it less. And then you don't have litter boxes that are sitting there where animals can reinfect themselves. It kind of goes back to that first step where we're mechanically removing um, our visible debris so that we're limiting the infectious, infectious doses of these pathogens in the environment. We also want to think about what other objects do our animals come in contact to. So if you have this community cat room, um, you have all of these toys, all of these enrichment items, which we want the animals to have to be happy, but it's can we, you know, once this group of animals has left, can we thoroughly disinfect these items? So you have this rope and carpeted cat tree. Those are really hard to clean, especially if you get something like a ringworm on those. So if you have something like that, which people may donate or you may buy, um, you might want to think about either discarding it afterwards or switching to something like a plastic shelving that the animals can still climb on and get that vertical space, get that enrichment, but it's going to be a lot easier to disinfect. Um, the same goes with some of the other toys um, that are in here, as well as um, any blankets. Um, it goes with carriers as well for cats. Um, you want to make sure that your carriers can be taken apart and fully cleaned. I know we have those carriers that often get rusted shut and a lot of water and pathogens can sit between the cracks if you've got animals that are sneezing in there, animals that have diarrhea when they get stressed in the carrier. You want your carriers to be fully disinfected as well. And then of course we want to think about our laundry. So of course in some of these you've got blankets, we've got dog beds that all these animals are coming into contact with. And with our laundry, um, you want to be using hot water and with bleach. You don't want to overload your washing machine because number one, that's going to break it. Number two, um, you're not going to get a thorough cleaning action of the towels of anything that's in there. And then you want it to thoroughly dry afterwards. So what about our animal stress and safety? Number one is, are we going to be using chemicals that are going to be safe for these animals? So we want to make sure we're properly diluting them, using them at safe concentrations, rinsing them afterwards. Animals can really be affected by any chemical burns from um, chemicals that are left on these properties. But then, you know, in addition to safety, you want to think about their stress level. As we're walking through, we're opening cage doors, we're picking up animals, moving them wherever they are. I know when I was a kennel technician, um, I didn't have headphones, I would just kind of blast music, which isn't great because that's another stressor on the animals. So you want to kind of create a routine, limit it to certain times of the day. It could be more than once, but create a routine, especially for your animals that are going to be there for days or weeks, or unfortunately some of those that are there for months. That helps minimize animal stress. Um, and then as you're going through cat areas, dog runs, being mindful of how rough you're opening and shutting cage doors for any animals that may still be in there or as you're moving them out of the kennel so you can clean them. Another good way to minimize animal stress is spot cleaning. And spot cleaning, um, I'll mention, generally is used for adult cats and I'll talk about why at the end of this slide. But spot cleaning is going to be a minimal cleaning that's done for the, while the animal's there. This is compared to our daily cleaning where we often think about taking an animal out, putting it in a carrier, going through, replacing everything that's in there, disinfecting the kennel, you know, putting the animal back in. Um, or compared to deep cleaning where if you have an animal that's been there for a prolonged time or you know, between groups of animals where you're, you may choose it, maybe you're not using your quaternary ammonia compound, maybe you're using bleach um, to get a real thorough cleaning of um, all the spaces in the kennel. 
So spot cleaning is kind of, you know, I've got our example here of these two kittens that um, are in their little cages. You can go through, if you have a really nice kitten, they sit up at the top while you come in and clean. Or if you have adult cats that have their little hidey boxes, you can leave them in there so they can hide in their box. You're minimizing the amount that you're putting the hands on, pulling the animal out. So you can go through and scoop their litter boxes, give them fresh food and water. Um, if they vomited or if they're anything dirty, you can remove any towels, give them new stuff, give them new toys as needed. It like I said, it reduces that animal handling and it leaves their sense in place. So you have animals that are taken from wherever they were, put in this new environment. You're going through, you're doing a harsh chemical smell that kind of runs through. And for some of these, you're doing that daily. So every day you're creating this stress. And when you leave their sense in place on their blankets, on their um, toys, it gives them a little bit more comfort. Like I mentioned, it's not appropriate for every animal. It's generally used for our adult cats and our cats with our non-infectious diseases. And that all goes back to making sure we're eliminating the doses of the pathogens in the environment. So if you have kittens that are having diarrhea, spot cleaning is not a good choice for them because if you're leaving some of those pathogens in place, as they sporulate the next day, they can become reinfected. The same with maybe some of our um, URI kittens, our upper respiratory, if they're sneezing all over the walls and there's just snot all over the walls, those may need to be cleaned. We also want to think about our fomites spread by staff. So fomites are inanimate objects that are going to be spreading these different pathogens as we move from animal to animal. Um, number one, we want to think about our clothing. I definitely saw this puppy and wanted to pick it up and snuggle it. Um, and that really was not allowed. Um, this was a puppy that had come in. So you want to think about, you know, as I'm picking up these animals, even if you're trying to restrain them, it's really hard, especially with the big dogs, to try to restrain without really putting your body on them. Um, or some of the cats, you only have two hands, and somehow cats need like four hands to be restrained. So you want to think about what, um, you know, what is that contact with your clothing. So if you're working with the animals a lot, or even if you have staff that's going through and using like hose sprayers, you get a lot of that backsplash that's gonna aerosolize some of the pathogens that were on the ground. Think about having dedicated clothing. So that could be you know, a different scrub top. It could be having coveralls. It could be having an apron that you use while you clean. And when you're finished with that section of animals, you either switch out into something new, or you know, maybe that's the only section that you work with. It also includes shoes. Um, so if you have a dedicated pair of shoes that you can leave at the shelter, or if you have rubber boots that can be cleaned and disinfected between certain areas, I think it not only helps limit fomite spread within the shelter, but you also have to think about, you know, what is stuck to the bottom of your shoe that you're taking home at the end of the day to your house. Um, cleaning materials are often another big one. Um, I know I definitely would take the bottle of bleach or whatever Excel, spray it in the cage, either stick it in the cage or stick it on the kennel and then clean there, drag it over, hang it on the next one, clean that one, hang it on the next one. So I have this bleach bottle that's you know, picking up pathogens in that area and moving it to these next cages over and over. So you may have carts of cleaning supplies that go with you. You know, think about are you going from areas where you know animals are sick to going to where animals are healthy. This might be where you have dedicated supplies in each room or in each section so that you're limiting the amount of stuff that moves from one area to the next. Um, you also want to think about mops. Mops never really made sense to me because um, you're cleaning the floor, putting that mop in this what was fresh water that's now contaminated and using it now to a different section of either the floor or a different room. Um, so either look at having separate mops and separate mop, bu mop buckets because where they really are important. It's hard to, to not clean the floor without a mop. Um, so think about having um, separate mops for each area or even you know a lot of the mops can um, be taken off the hinges, thrown in the washing machine. You can use bleach, disinfect it, make sure it dries properly. Um, we also think about our hands. Hands are always a huge issue, especially in human health care. So as mentioned, if anybody was here for Dr. Putnam's talk yesterday, um, gloves are always our number one um, you know, ideal. Um, having gloves on between either each individual animal or if you have litters between groups of animals. But I know they can be irritating. Um, if you've got a lot of animals coming through, it can also be expensive as you're buying new gloves. Um, kind of keeping up with that may be difficult. So after gloves, if gloves aren't available, you want to think about hand washing. So hand washing is going to be our next step, and that's going to be hand washing properly, using warm water, getting all surfaces of your hands for about 20 to 30 seconds, rinsing and drying afterwards. 
Um, so it's, it's important to have washing stations available wherever you're working with the animals and making sure you have somebody to restock those. It's often easier to have somebody who's in charge of making sure every place has paper towels, every place has soap, um, everywhere the water is working. But sometimes you may be in areas where you don't have a sink available um, or you can't you know, drop what you're doing, walk across, wash your hands, come back. So that's when our hand sanitizers come into play. And we have to think about our hand sanitizers. Um, usually they're alcohol-based, and that's what's recommended. And you want to use about a 60% concentration of alcohol. Um, but they're not going to get our unenveloped viruses. So if we're working, you know, if this puppy had parvovirus, um, we don't want to use an alcohol afterwards because it's not going to effectively get it. I mean, it's better than nothing. But um, at that point, you're going to want to either have gloves or hand washing. <laughs> And hand washing goes back to uh, physically removing pathogens from the environment. And our sanitizers aren't going to do that. Our sanitizers are going to just kill a limited amount of stuff that's on the surface of our hands. And then a common one is always foot baths. People always want to always know if foot baths are effective. Um, generally, the consensus is no. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, um, the, co the most common disinfectant that's used in foot baths is often bleach. And as we mentioned earlier, bleach is really inactivated by organic matter. So as you're walking around, as your shoes are picking up dirt, you step in that foot bath. Um, it may be good for a handful of times, and then it needs to be replaced because all that bleach is now swimming in dirt, swimming in any, um, if you stepped in any feces, that's all gonna be now in your bucket of bleach. So it would have to be changed readily. You also wanna think about your footwear. I know I always have um, an old pair of sneakers that do have mesh. So if you're sitting in chemicals, you now have something that's going to seep through your shoes. Um, if your staff doesn't have you know, appropriate footwear to be putting in um, you know, a foot bath. And then when we, when we talk about bleach, our contact time was 10 minutes. You know, is it really effective to sit to stand there for 10 minutes? Some of the other disinfectants, and I think with bleach too, if you're using them as a foot bath, I recommend one minute of contact time, but even standing there for one minute before you kind of move on is not really going to be effective. I mean, who's really going to do that? So for the most part, when you think about foot baths, if you have a question about whether you want to use them, you might want to think about switching to either disposable booties that you can put on, having dedicated shoes that you leave there, or having something like rubber boots that can be cleaned and disinfected afterwards. So now that we've thought about all of those things, now we want to think about in what order are we going to clean our hospital or our shelter. Um, Generally, we want to start with our animals that are going to be most susceptible to disease. These are going to be our healthy animals that are young ones, our puppies, our kittens, that their immune systems really aren't as developed just because they're young. Um, and from them, we're going to move to our healthy adults. If we pick up something from the kittens, the adults may have a stronger immune system so that they may not um, get disease. And then from then, we, from then, we move on to our stray and our quarantined animals. These animals really don't know. They may look healthy, but we don't know if they're shedding anything, if they have any respiratory infections. And then finally, to our unhealthy animals, the ones we know are sick. Because it really doesn't make sense to clean your sick animals and then move on to your healthy ones, even you know you're covered in kind of these dirty, nasty pathogens. Now, unfortunately, for some of these, that means our sick animals may get cleaned last. So if you're in an area where you don't think you can get to everybody else and then get to your unhealthy population in a humane amount of time, so they're not sitting there in their own filth all day, they're not suffering before they get any kind of treatment, um, you might want to think about using whatever extra resources you have, your dedicated staff, to um, dedicate to your unhealthy animals. That way they have their own team and then somebody else can be working on your healthy young and then your healthy adult and those animals so that your unhealthy ones aren't sitting there all day. We also do want to think about our zoonotic diseases. Um, commonly here, it's going to be rabies. Think about our unvaccinated animals or the animals that we don't know um, what, uh, their, what their quarantines, their vaccination statuses are. Um, toxoplasmosis is another one to think about if you have any um, pregnant workers. You really can't go ask one of your staff members if they're pregnant. Um, so it's really important then to educate your staff. It's a really, here's a really good sign. I know it's hard to read um, about toxoplasmosis that you can put on the kennel and then um, you know, list what the outcomes are if you are somebody who's gonna be working with toxoplasmosis. So having these clear signs available, having these signs also limit your interaction so that you're not um, having as many people as possible come in, it really limits it. The same goes with your rabies animals so that you have your rabies vaccinated staff working with them. And then your personal protective equipment, 
gloves at minimum, making sure you're washing hands. And then staff safety, I'll mention really quickly, a lot of times we buy these concentrated products and then dilute them out into smaller bottles. Um, so we wanna make sure that people know what that bottle is, when it was made, what are the risks of using it? Um, you know, do I have to wear gloves? Is it gonna be an eye irritant if I use it? And then having your um, product, your material safety data sheets available. These are the sheets that come from the manufacturer that say, if it gets in your eyes, what do you do? If it accidentally gets ingested, what do you do? Um, I've actually worked at a practice where an OSHA agent person, I don't know what they are, they came in and asked one of our staff members, where is the material safety data sheet for this thing? Um, so it's important that your staff knows where it is for their own safety, of course, but then also for the regulations behind it. And I know AHA um, sells some labels that you can buy and just stick on and just add what it is, or you can kind of um, make your own so that they're labeled properly. But the ultimate key for success is training. So that's like coming to meetings like this. Um, you know, making sure your staff really knows why we're doing things a certain way, what are the pathogens we're trying to get. Um, and this can involve having written protocols. A lot of shelters have a really high staff turnover. So often you have staff that may not know the full, they may be new and are training somebody new. Or you have staff that may have bad habits and are instilling those bad habits in new staff members that come through. So having written protocols that are laminated and available to wherever your staff cleans. It could be by the sink where they pick up their bleach for the day to kind of give them the steps. Um, education, and I'll give you some tools for education in a minute. But having staff meetings, number one, talk to your staff to say, you know, is it realistic that we're asking you to have a 10 minute contact time? Is that feasible? You know, do you have enough time to get to all the animals that you need to in the day? Um, do you have any questions about why certain disinfectants are being used? And then monitoring your staff to make sure they are going through these steps properly because it's often staff compliance that falls when we look at you know, when our disease outbreaks are occurring. So finally, some training tools to kind of, um, I know it can be daunting to kind of create a presentation to go back and to give it to your staff. So some good training tools are GlowGerm. GlowGerm is a um, powder that fluoresces. Um, I actually used it in vet school. It was sprayed on me and then I had to go wash my hands. Um, and um, when you come back afterwards, you can shine a black light over it. I'm sure you could probably use a woods light if you have a woods light to fluoresce it as well. Um, but it makes you think about, are you cleaning your hands properly? You can put it on any surfaces if you want to clean a counter or a kennel. Um, I think it makes you think about, am I touching, did I touch my jacket? Did I touch the, the, um, the handles for the sink? You know, what are all the things that I touch and how can I track where this powder goes? Um, it's relatively inexpensive. I think for a little bottle, it's about $30, $40, um, but it lasts a long time. It's a good training tool. I thought it was really fun um, just to kind of see how your diseases are spreading. And then another one, you know, you may not feel confident or have all the resources to stand and give a presentation to your staff, but the ASPCA Pro and Maddie's Fund do have some webinars that are on their website that you can, you know, buy pizza for your staff, sit in your break room or wherever, kind of let these run, and then at the end talk about um, you know, whatever questions you have, what's going to work for your shelter and what's not. You know, kind of having those lunch and learns that you create. And I've got some uh, resources that talk about it. So I've got some web the websites for the webinars, as well as a couple different product labels, and then the ASPCO, ASPCA um, Pro websites that I mentioned. And I do want to thank the ASPCA and Maddie's Fund for putting on this conference and then Cornell for hosting. And then, of course, for the John T. and Jane A. Wiederhold Foundation for funding my position.